So this is the second part of human anatomy and, uh, and physiology for um, reproduction. And so let's go ahead. Last time we talked about the anatomy of the male reproductive system, and to, today we're going to talk about how it kind of works. Here's a quick overview here of how it works. And remember, we're going to talk about both types of uh, reproduction. Remember, we have cellular reproduction, which is mitosis. Well, that happens here too. And so we're going to take body cells and we're going to make more body cells. And then some of those body cells are going to become gametes. And so the process that we're going to do that, remember, is meiosis. And meiosis, remember, has two uh, divisions. So we're going to get division here, and we're going to wind up with two cells, but we're also going to get another division so that we wind up with four cells. And so remember with meiosis, we're going to start out with one cell, but we're going to wind up with four cells that are not alike, and they're not like the original. Well, the process takes place in two steps. And so the first step uh, is meiosis. But look what you get. We go through this whole process, and we're going to get cells that look like this. Well, look at them. They do not look like sperm. They're round. They don't have a tail. They're, they don't have anything that looks like a sperm. And so we're going to have to go through a process of taking these cells to make them look like these, sperm. And that process is called spermiogenesis. So it's a two-step process to go from just this plain old normal body cell all the way to complete sperm. So let's look at it. So just a little bit of review. Remember all body cells are going to have these two in. In other words, they have two sets of chromosomes. They're paired and they're said to be diploid. So diploid and two in are used interchangeably. And humans have 23 of these pairs of chromosomes. But if we make gametes, remember we don't have pairs anymore. We only have 23. And so gametes are not diploid. They're haploid. They're not 2N. They're 1N. And so in order to do that, we're going to have to use this process of meiosis. Well, we don't start out... <coughs> With sperm, though, we start out with body cells. And the spot, body cells that we're going to start out with are called spermatogonia. So spermatogonia are plain old body cells. And they're 2N. They're diploid. Well, you're born with a bunch of uh, spermatogonia. But nothing happens to them until you reach puberty. And then at puberty, those cells are going to begin to divide. And so as they divide, they're going to make more spermatogonia. And we're actually going to wind up with two types of spermatogonia. So spermatogonia type A never becomes sperm. They stay close to the outside wall of the seminiferous tubule, and they just go through mitosis over and over and over again. So spermatogonia type A, they don't make sperm. They make more spermatogonia. Remember we said that an average adult male produces about 100 million sperm every 24 hours. Well, it, it would not take very long to run out of spermatogonia unless you were making more of them. And we make more of those by mitosis. And again, these are type A cells. So if we back up to this picture, that's these right here. So there's a spermatogonia. These spermatogonia are the type A. And so again, they don't become sperm. They don't leave. They stay right here at the base against the seminiferous tubule right there at the wall. And they're going to go through mitosis over and over and over again and just make more spermatogonia. But there's another type of spermatogonia, and these are called type B. And so type B spermatogonia will become sperm. And so 
they're moved toward the hollow space. They're more moved toward the lumen. And then they begin the process of meiosis. Well, as soon as they begin the process of meiosis, their name changes. They're not called type B spermatogonia anymore. They're called primary spermatocytes. So again, if we go back to our picture again, so here's our spermatogonia. Look, it's moved away from this base, it's moved away from the basement membrane. So this is a type B spermatogonium. And again, as soon as it enters the process of meiosis, in other words, as soon as it goes into prophase one, the name changes, and then they become primary spermatocytes. They don't look any different than these type B spermatogonia, except they have become the process, begun the process of meiosis. And what they're going to do is they're going to do DNA replication. Remember, they're going to find each other. We're going to form tetrads. All of that is going to happen in this primary spermatocyte. So two types of spermatogonia, type A, which make more spermatogonia, type B, which are going to begin the process of making sperm. And as soon as they do that process or begin that process, they're called primary spermatocytes. So here's a different diagram, the same thing. On this side, it's a simplified diagram. Over here is what it might look like inside the seminiferous tubule. But here's the wall right here. Here's this wall right here. And so here's where the spermatogonia hang out, right along the wall. And then some of them are type A. They just make more spermatogonia. Some of them are type B when they get pushed away from the wall and begin the process of meiosis. Any questions? So let's look at this process of meiosis. So here's a real picture here, and there's our basement membrane right there, that wall. So that means all of these cells are those spermatogonia. Again, there are two types, the ones that hang around here, type A. But look, some of them are going to get pushed away like that. And when they get pushed away and they enter the process of meiosis, now their name changes. They're called primary spermatocytes. Here's another view, and if we take this a drawing and blow it up, it looks like this. So here's the wall. These are our spermatogonia. But these have been pushed away, and they've become the, or begun the process of meiosis. So now they're called primary spermatocytes. So primary spermatocytes are going to undergo meiosis one. So remember what happens in meiosis one, this cell, uh, we're going to duplicate the DNA. So we're not just going to have pairs. Remember, we're going to have pairs with identical copies. And they're all going to find each other. And they're going to form these things called tetrads. And then we're going to separate the pairs. So remember, all the left shoes are going to go one way and all the right shoes are going to go another way. And we're going to divide. Well, as soon as we divide, the name changes. They're not called primary spermatocytes anymore. They're called secondary spermatocytes. And so secondary spermatocytes are going to go undergo meiosis too. So these cells, remember now all the left shoes are over here. All the right shoes are over here. We don't have pairs anymore. These are one in cells. They're haploid. But they haven't finished because there's two copies of each one. So we're going to go through meiosis two. And what's going to happen now is we're going to separate the, the identical chromosomes. And so over here, we're going to have one. Over here is its pair mate. Over here and its pair mate. And so we're going to wind up with four cells. Well, as soon as that happens, their name changes again. They're not called secondary spermatocytes. Now they're called spermatids. 
And so you can see that exact thing happening here. So here's meiosis one. So here's our primary spermatocyte. There it is right there. We're going to get the duplication of the chromosomes. We're going to find tetrads. We're going to split the pairs and we're going to wind up with two secondary spermatocytes. Remember these are one in, but they still have two copies of everything. Those secondary spermatocytes are going to go into meiosis two. And again, what's going to happen is we're going to take and we're going to separate the two copies into different cells. And we're going to wind up with four spermatids. And you can see that happening here. There's the spermatogonia. Here's our primary spermatocytes. Here's our secondary spermatocytes. And then finally, closest to the lumen are these spermatids. So you can actually see the whole process happening if you start out here and go toward the lumen. Any questions? Well, if we take this and blow it up, it looks like this. So here's our spermatogonia. Then they become primary spermatocytes. They undergo a division. And then we have secondary spermatocytes. They undergo another division. And then we have spermatids. Any questions? But look, here we are right here. There's our spermatids, and they're very in early in the process, so sometimes they're called early spermatids. But look at them. They don't look anything like sperm. So we're going to somehow take these round cells and turn them into these cells that look like this. And so that's the second part of this process, and that's spermiogenesis. So let's look at spermiogenesis. We're going to go from spermatids to fully formed sperm. And here's the way it looks. It looks like this. There's an early spermatid right there. And then here's a sperm over here. Well, look, we've got to do a bunch of things to get from here over to here. And so what happens is, first of all, we're going to develop a little Golgi right here. Remember, Golgi stores the products that come out of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. We're going to form that Golgi. And the Golgi then is going to put the products in here in this little vesicle, a little sac, if you will. And that vesicle is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And what it's going to do is it's going to contain enzymes. Those enzymes are going to help the sperm fertilize the egg. In order for the sperm to fertilize the egg, it has to digest its way into the egg. And that's what these, sperm, or these enzymes are for. Another thing that happens is, look at the size of the nucleus here. Well, it's going to get smaller and smaller. The DNA is going to fold up like crazy. It's going to condense. And so it's going to be tightly, tightly, tightly packed inside this nucleus. And so instead of it being spread out, it's packed in there so, so tightly. So it takes up a lot less room. Another thing that happens is, look, we have no tail. And so what's going to happen is the centrioles are going to move here and they're going to begin to secrete little microtubules and they're going to form a tail, which is really just a flagellum. And so you can see the tail growing here, the tail growing here, and the tail growing here. And then look at how much cytoplasm this cell has. And so what's going to happen is we're going to lose cytoplasm. We're going to shed all the excess cytoplasm. So that there's very little left when you get over here. And then the last thing that's going to happen is 
we also are going to need a lot of energy to power this cell because it has to swim. And it takes a lot of energy to swim. Well, the way we're going to get ATP is we're going to get it from mitochondria. And so we're going to need a lot of mitochondria. And so the mitochondria are going to divide and multiply, and we're going to get a ton of these mitochondria. And they're going to wind up in this middle part of the cell. And so when we finish the cell, look, it looks completely different. And it's divided up into three parts. We have a head. Head is where we have this cap, which is called the acrosome, and that's where the enzymes are. It's where we have the nucleus. That's where the DNA is. And then we have the midpiece. And the midpiece is where all of these chromosomes, oh, sorry, all of these mitochondria are located. And then finally we have the tail. And remember the tail is basically just a flagellum. So we have a head, a midpiece, and a tail. And when you look at it, it looks like this. So there's our acrosome. Remember, that's where the enzymes are. There's the nucleus. That's where the DNA is. That forms the head. The midpiece is where all those mitochondria are located. It's also where the tubules are anchored to the head. And then the long tail and it's somewhat just like a flagellum. Any questions about any of that? So let's go back and look at it again. So here's that process right here. So this part is meiosis. This part is spermiogenesis. Same thing over there. And then we're going to get these sperm. Well, sperm, in fact, all of these cells are basically very, very helpless. In other words, they really can't do anything for themselves. They can't feed themselves or nourish themselves. They can't move. They can't do anything. And so they need helpers. And so there's these giant cells that are also in the seminiferous tubule. And if you look at this giant cell here, sort of looks like that. That's one of them. And then here's another one over here. This yellow cell looks like this. These are those helper cells. Well, they used to be called nurse cells, which is actually a fairly good name for them if you think about what nurses do. But technically they're called Sertoli cells. And again, that's a person's name, and so that is also kind of going away. And now they're called sustentacular cells. And so look, they have the word sustenance in it, sustentacular cells. So let's look at these cells. Again, it's got the word sustenance in it, which means to nourish. But that isn't all they do. They do a bunch of things. Remember, they protect them. And one of the ways they protect them is they form these tight junctions. In other words, there's another wall that separates the, the male's blood from the testis. Because when these cells start developing, they're not normal cells anymore. The sperm are not there when the thymus is, and the bone marrow are educating the B cells and the T cells. And so sperm are actually considered to be foreign cells. And so this male's immune system, if it could, would attack those cells. But there's this wall in here that they can't get across. It's called the blood testis barrier. And if we back up and look at this picture here, 
you can see the blood testis barrier right there. It's these tight junctions. And so, again, the man's immune system cannot get there and destroy the sperm. So, spermatogonia were there before, uh, before puberty. And so they're considered self. But all these other cells, the secondary spermatocytes, the spermatids, the sperm, are considered non-self. They're considered foreign. And so again, they have to be protected. And so the sustentacular cells do that. And again, that's these yellow cells with this big purple nucleus. Those are the sustentacular cells. That's not all sustentacular cells do, though. They also provide nutrients. In other words, they nourish these cells. They actually also move them. Remember, they're going to start out out here next to the wall, but they're going to get moved toward the lumen. And it's the sustentacular cells that are going to do the moving. And then we already, they protect them. So these cells are really important. Any questions about any of that? So if we go back to this picture, can everybody interpret everything that's going on in this picture? Hopefully you can. Type A, type B, primary, secondary, the spermatids, sperm, and these sustentacular cells. Any questions? Okay, well, something has to be controlling reproduction. And remember, our two systems for controlling or for regulation are the nervous system and the endocrine system. Remember, the nervous system is good for short-term things. But reproduction is not short-term. It's ongoing. It lasts almost most of their life. And so the system that's going to be in control for long term, remember, is the endocrine system. And remember, the endocrine system is going to work through hormones. So there are four, I guess you could say five hormones that are involved. One of these is GNRH. GNRH stands for gonadotropin releasing hormone. And it comes from the hypothalamus. Remember, we talked about the hypothalamus and we talked about releasing and inhibiting hormones. Well, this is a releasing hormone. And what it's going to release are the gonadotropins. Well, these are the gonadotropins. And they come from the pituitary. So the gonadotropin releasing hormone is going to go to the pituitary and it's going to cause these to be released. And so LH, remember, stands for luteinizing hormone. Well, in males, that doesn't mean much. And so in males, sometimes it's used by a different name, which is called interstitial cell stimulating hormone. But I don't like to use that because it, it makes it sound like it's a different hormone than this one which we're going to talk about more in the female, but they're exactly the same hormone. And then FSH, remember, stands for follicle stimulating hormone. Well, that doesn't mean much in the male either, but they haven't changed it to something else. And then there's one more hormone that we're going to talk about, and that's the male, primary male sex hormone. That's testosterone. So all of these are going to have big effects. And then finally, there's one other hormone called inhibin. We don't really see that it does that much, except it does exactly what it sounds like. It inhibits something. And what it inhibits is the release of FSH. So these hormones are going to be all working together in order to create 
reproduction in the male. So let's look at it. It's going to first start in the brain. So the brain, the hypothalamus specifically, is in charge. And it picks up all kinds of information internally, externally, environmentally, all kinds of info. And at some point, this male is going to get old enough to enter puberty. Well, as soon as that happens, what's going to happen is the hypothalamus is going to decide, okay, it's time. And so it's going to begin to release this GNRH. Again, remember GNRH states stands for gonadotropin releasing hormone. This is going to go to the anterior pituitary. That's where it's going to go. So remember how we're going to talk to the anterior pituitary. We're going to go through here capillaries, and then we're going to have those veins, and then we're going to have another set of capillaries, and it's going to come out the anterior pituitary. When it gets there, the anterior pituitary is going to release the gonadotropins, which are LH and FSH. And they're going to enter the general circulation. And they're going to head to the gonad. Well, remember the gonad in male is the testis. And so they're going to head to the gonad. And they're going to do two different things. In males, FSH is going to cause the production of a protein. So we're going to see that in a minute. It's called androgen binding protein. And an LH is going to go and it's going to cause the release of hormones, namely testosterone. So let's look at it in a little more detail. So again, first thing that happens is hypothalamus is going to release GnRH. So that's the first thing. And that's going to go to the anterior pituitary. In the anterior pituitary, we're going to release FSH and LH. And again, there's that interstitial cell uh, stimulating hormone. But FSH and LH. And then if we look at what FSH does, it's going to go to the testis. And it's going to cause the production of something called androgen binding protein. Androgen. Androgen means male sex hormone. Androgen binding protein. So it's going to bind a male sex hormone. And that's abbreviated ABP. And then LH. What LH is going to do is it's going to go to those interstitial cells. Remember the interstitial cells of Leydig? They're between the um, seminiferous tubules. And it's going to cause those interstitial cells to make testosterone, which is an androgen. So look, we have an androgen. And we have an androgen binding protein. And that's exactly what they're going to do. The testosterone is going to bind to the androgen binding protein. And together, these two are going to stimulate spermatogenesis. They're going to stimulate the formation of sperm. So we're going to go into meiosis, and then we're going to do spermiogenesis, and we're going to have the sperm. Make sense? Is everybody clear on what these hormones do? So GnRH causes the release of FSH and LH. FSH causes the production of antigen binding protein. LH causes these cells to make testosterone, which is an androgen. These two are going to bind together, and they're going to cause spermatogenesis to happen. Any questions? There's that one other hormone, though. We don't want 
to make too many sperm, yes, we're making 100 million every 24 hours, and that's a lot, but still, you don't want it to be uncontrolled. We want to keep it right around where it's supposed to be. So we're stimulating it here. We're making sperm grow. So if this thing keeps putting out GnRH, and if it keeps putting out FSH and LH, this number is going to go way up but we have negative feedback and the negative feedback tells this system that we've had enough so there's negative feedback by inhibin and there's negative feedback by testosterone so when these reach a certain level they go up this goes down and then this is going to fall and they're going to fall and this is going to go back up and then they're going to go up and this is going to go down so if we graph it remember it's going to look like all negative feedback systems is going to look like this make sense to everyone any questions So we wind up making sperm. That's not all that happens though. Testosterone is also, besides involved in, in spermatogenesis, it's also released into the general circulation. And testosterone is going to cause a bunch of things to happen all over the body. And we're going to get what are called secondary sex characteristics. So secondary means they're not absolutely required for reproduction. They come along afterwards or secondarily. And so secondary sex characteristics are the things that we think of when you think of what makes a male look like a male. And so when you think about a male, you can picture a male and there's some characteristics that males have. Now again, this is an adult male. So if you think about an adult male, they tend to have facial hair and they tend to have uh, armpit hair and pubic hair and you could also add chest hair. They also have a bigger, wider chest than a female and their voice is deeper. Their bones grow, their muscles grow. And so you wind up with bones that are very dense and muscles that are large, a lot of mass. And even the skin is affected, gets thicker. And those uh, sebaceous glands that we talked about back in A&P1 become very, very active. And remember when they become very, very active? That's when you get acne. And so this is all due to this whole process of these hormones, GnRH, and then LH, and then testosterone, and then we get those secondary sex characteristics. Not only that, but testosterone is also what causes the libido of males and also females. But remember, libido is the sex drive. And so that's what causes this sex drive. And the higher the testosterone level in general, the higher the sex drive. So here's kind of a summary of all that. So let's go through it one more time. So remember where it's all going to start. It's all going to start in the brain. So the brain is in charge of reproduction. We're going to get all this information that's going to feed in, and it's going to feed into the hypothalamus. Remember, in, in young males, the hypothalamus is not releasing this. But at some point, all this information, age, day length, nutrition level, all kinds of stuff feeds in there until finally we're going to hit puberty. And then at puberty, what's going to happen is the hypothalamus is going to be begin to release this 
GnRH, gonadotropin releasing hormone. It's going to go to the anterior pituitary, and we're going to get the release of LH and FSH. Remember what LH is going to do? LH is going to go to the testis. It's going to go to these interstitial cells, and it's going to cause testosterone to be released. Remember, testosterone is an androgen. FSH is also going to go to the testis, but it's going to go to those sustentacular cells and cause them to produce androgen binding protein. So testosterone is an androgen. There's androgen binding protein right next to it. They're going to together stimulate spermatogenesis and spermiogenesis. And then we're going to feed back negatively, feed back negatively to keep it from getting too much. And then finally, remember testosterone is just going to stay in the testis. It's going to enter the general circulation and it's going to cause effects all over the body, muscles, bone, hair growth, glands, organs. It also has an effect on behavior. Remember, it causes a sex drive, but it also increases aggression and things like that. So this is a really nice summary slide of what goes on with the endocrine uh, regulation of male reproduction. Any questions about any of that? Well, males don't have something similar to what females do. Females, remember they, when they enter reproduction, it's about age 10 or 11 or something like that, but there's a limited amount of time where that they can reproduce. At some point, somewhere around 45, maybe or 50, sometimes earlier, they're going to stop reproducing. They're going to go through what's called menopause. Well, males don't have a menopause, but that doesn't mean that age doesn't have an effect on reproduction because it does. It has an effect on all aspects of reproduction, all of this. And so if you look at the number of sperm, it goes down. If you look at the levels of these hormones, it goes down. But the one that's the most dramatic or has the biggest effect is this testosterone because it has all of these other effects as well. And these are visible effects. And so if you look at what happens to testosterone, slowly over time it decreases until when you reach you know, 90, there's only this much testosterone. So there's a whole push now to replace testosterone called hormone replacement therapy and there's a huge market for it now so when males reach a certain age usually this some age right here somewhere they begin to notice the effects of this decreased testosterone they have a decreased sex drive they have they start losing muscle they start losing bone all of the things that it causes, even hair, all sorts of things can change. And so these males don't like that. They want to feel young again. And so they actually start injecting testosterone. And so there's a whole bunch of doctors who develop clinics based totally or 100% on this. And basically all they do is give these testosterone injections. Now, of course, they have to do things like exams and stuff like that to make sure you're healthy enough for it. But this is usually not covered by insurance. And so these, these males are paying out of pocket anywhere from about $1,000 to $2,000 a month just for this hormone replacement therapy. So that's pretty much the male reproductive system. Any questions about any of it?
Well, it's a little earlier than what we usually do, but I think we're going to stop here because we've reached the stopping point. So if you come back tomorrow, we're going to start on the female. And the female will probably take about two to three days, and then we'll be done completely. So I think we'll probably be done completely on Monday. Um, if not, we certainly will on Tuesday. Anybody have any questions? Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording there.